So even though stable coins are only 10% of the aggregate market cap of all crypto assets, there's 70 to 80% of all the transactional value that's being processed on blockchains. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more listeners and bring you more exciting content in the future. Hello, and welcome to The Crypto Brief, a podcast from Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. Every week we get together to discuss current events and trends in blockchain technology, tokenization, DeFi, NFTs, mining, and related aspects of the crypto ecosystem. I'm your co-host, Ryan Stubbe, Director of Bitcoin Mining, and I'm joined by Jason Ward, Head of the Blockchain Incubator, Parth Gargava, Product Architect with Fidelity Labs, and Jack Newrider, Research Associate with Avon Ventures. Before we begin, just a friendly reminder that this discussion is for educational purposes only and should not be viewed as investment advice or a recommendation for any security or asset. The views expressed are those of the co-hosts and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. As we all know, crypto as an asset class is highly volatile, can become illiquid at any time, and is only for those investors with a high risk tolerance. Let's dive into what's been happening recently. All right. So this afternoon, we have the pleasure of welcoming Nick Carter to the FCAT Crypto Brief Podcast. So uh, for those who don't know, Nick is a Fidelity alum, but he's currently a partner at Castle Island Ventures and also a co-founder and board member of Coinmetrics. So Nick, your reputation amongst Fidelity folks and people who listen to the podcast precedes you, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. It's it's great to be back virtually. You know, But yeah, great to be back. It's funny because I, I think back to uh, when we were we first met and you were at Fidelity and, and then to see how your career has taken off uh, over the past several years. Uh, it's been really exciting. Uh, we, we talk about it a lot in terms of how Fidelity has such a strong internal network, but also network of alumni. And, and you're clearly uh, one of the key representatives of that. But one of the things I wanted to sort of kick off is you know people might know you from the coin metrics or from Cass Island. But a lot of people who listen to the podcast may not know how you actually got started in the digital asset and blockchain space. So it's a bit of a generic question, but what was the catalyst that brought you to become a quote unquote crypto enthusiast? <laughs> oh man, it was such a funny journey. I don't Fidelity played a huge role in it. I owe a lot to Fidelity. I the first thing I ever did with crypto was I mined Dogecoin on my gaming rig when I was in college in 2013. <laughs> because I thought I really like the idea of turning electricity into a tradable commodity. And then I kind of forgot about crypto for a while. And then I lost the hard drive that all the Doge coins were on. So that, uh, that was a write off. But, uh, I, you know, I learned about Bitcoin after that. I spent, I took it more seriously, just reading the subreddit. And then 2015, 16, I was, um, I decided to do a master's, um, go to business school and then, in the midst of that, I wrote my dissertation on crypto assets. I was really excited by them. And I decided that I wanted to work in the crypto space. At the time, there weren't really a lot of jobs in the crypto space at all. And I was lucky enough to get connected to Matt Walsh, uh, who was at Fidelity at the time and was starting a, a fund focused on crypto. And so I joined that fund in uh, 2017. And 2017 was when everything went completely crazy in crypto for the first time, really. And uh, so that was, uh, yeah, and then I did a lot of writing and then eventually we left and we started Castle Island, but that was kind of the genesis of it. That's that's awesome. It's funny. Matt actually played a role in some of my early crypto experience as well, because we were business partners working on use cases together. So, and now you guys are business partners investing in a, a wide range of companies and exploring the space from a completely different perspective. So it's very exciting to see. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun few years. I mean, I've been a f- kind of like a full time crypto person for about six years, and then paying attention to the industry for about a decade. So it, it felt like a lot longer than ten years, to be honest. Oh yeah, Crypt- uh, being in this space definitely feels like time passes by at an accelerated rate. You know, I, I know lately you've been out talking a lot about stable coins, and, and it's not a new thing for you. You've actually been talking about stable coins for quite a while, and. Um, if my memory is correct, it was probably the summer of 2020 when you originally wrote a uh, white paper around crypto dollars. I was curious if you could tell us what was it around that time that triggered that paper? And since then, uh, what have you found to be some of the most interesting applications? 
Yeah, that was, uh, that, I think in hindsight, quite prescient. I have always thought stablecoins were interesting, potentially a solution to a problem I see in the US, which is a lack of banking system vibrancy. Post Odd Frank, it's been very difficult to start a new bank, a new bank charter. And I think that reduces the competitiveness of the banking system and reduces the quality of the product offering that you know ultimately consumers are getting. Uh, also, the fact that interest rates were low for so long made it pretty hard to make money being a bank. And ever since stablecoins first emerged and kind of tether, I think it was created in 2015, 16, but you know, kind of exploded in 2018 and then really grew after that. I thought that it was a kind of ersatz form of banking. M- most stablecoins resemble banks in the way they operate. They issue liabilities, they have an asset portfolio of <laughs> varying maturities, depending on which stablecoin it is. And um, I was excited by that. I'm also a student of the free banking literature, which refers to various historical periods where banking uh, wasn't restricted in the way that it is now. The banks weren't public-private partnerships in the way that they are now. And there maybe weren't even central banks involved. The banks themselves were kind of self-regulating. And I'm an enthusiast of that literature. Folks like George Selgin, Larry White, others in this, let's say, more broadly Austrian school. And to me, stablecoins represented the promise to potentially restore free banking, at the very least, restore some vibrancy to the banking sector, which has been lacking. And uh, so in 2020, I set out to really write down this thesis that I had. And at the time, the supply of stablecoins was in the low single-digit billions. I wrote the white paper in January of 2020. And uh, I saw at that time in the data something very interesting, which was stablecoins were coming to increasingly dominate as a transactional tool on public blockchains. And previously, everybody had been under the impression that it would be Bitcoin or later on maybe Ethereum or payment tokens like Ripple or Stellar. Right? Uh, people thought these would be the transactional tools that people use on blockchains. But in the data, and at this time I was using CoinMetrics data, I noticed that stablecoins were linearly growing their market share as a transactional instrument. If you looked at it in terms of gross value settled on public blockchains, 2020 was 30%. And I thought this was a huge deal. I saw this data as like a eureka moment for me, actually. I was like, wow, so stablecoins are very small relative to the supply of other native crypto assets, but they're starting to dominate. They have a high velocity. So velocity being the number of times the average unit turns over in a given year, transactionally. Stablecoins at a much, much higher velocity than Bitcoin itself or Ether. And we're all talking about on-chain transactions here. We're not talking about exchange transactions. And um, this made me sit up and realize, wow, there's something interesting going on here, something different. You know, I'm seeing something in the data that evidences something about the real world that I hadn't figured out before. And I read the white paper, and I also tried to rebrand stablecoins as crypto dollars because I hate the term stablecoin. I think it's a very like historically contingent term that we call it a stablecoin. So I tried to rebrand it. That didn't work. People still call them stablecoins. Just ending the thought, fast forward to today, I rerun all of the same data that I did three years ago. Stablecoins now utterly dominate from a transactional perspective, 70 to 80% of all value settled on all of the major public blockchains is in stablecoin format. So not only is kind of not only are stablecoins dollarizing certain countries globally, like specific places around the world, but they're also dollarizing blockchains. Blockchains have themselves become dollarized. So even though stablecoins are only 10% of the aggregate market cap of all crypto assets, there's 70 to 80% of all the transactional value that's being processed on blockchains. So I kind of noticed this happening in 2020 and then fast forward today, like really happening aggressively. So I thought I would revisit that and update my thoughts on the sector. That is great. Um, I I love how you brought it from that point in time forward. But if, if we reflect, many of the people that were active in the ecosystem when you were coming up with this thesis and testing out initially, were anti-stablecoin or not anti-stablecoin. They didn't appreciate the potential because 
I remember having lots of conversations with with folks about they're they're not sexy, but they do have utility. And thinking about how funding occurs around the world, and I remember hearing a lot of pushback on, oh, they'll be dead in a year, or it's a you know a a ripple in the pond. There's much more to come, and it's it's been fascinating to see that although the the supply grew in that summer of DeFi and has since sort of contracted. As you pointed out appropriately, the velocity has grown significantly. So in spite of the fact that the total supply outstanding has contracted, it seems like the utility continues to expand. Totally. Yeah. And this is another thing. This is actually this is like sort of my more contemporary moment where I like sat up and realized something interesting was going on. As every other metric in crypto declined, whatever it is, liquidity, exchange volumes, number of users, number of new startups, venture capital dollars. As every one of those metrics has declined, and they all have in the last, let's say, 18 months, stablecoin usage has increased. So this defangs one of the major critiques of stablecoins, which I hear from non-crypto folks, which is their usage is solely tied to speculative activity on exchanges. Stablecoins are just for remitting funds to exchanges. They're just being used as a collateral on exchanges. They are being used for that, for sure. However, they have since decoupled from the sort of crypto exchange volumes. And there's clearly an element of utility that has nothing to do with the crypto market cycle. It's just its own thing. So stable coins themselves are a sector that's independent of sort of like the broader trends in crypto. They're not as exposed to the cyclical dynamics as other things are. So if you look at total value processed, it's been it's been down in the last year, but it's basically been flat for the last year for stable coins on chain value transacted. The number of active addresses has been linearly up, linearly up, and it's at an all time high right now. Weekly active addresses, monthly active addresses, uh, and so you know those things are really important to take note of, especially as we're at a time in crypto where a lot of people are losing faith in the industry. And there's a reckoning of sorts. I see a lot of people that have been in crypto for, you know, half, half a decade, for an entire decade, that are questioning if there's any utility here. Like, how, what have we been building? Like, has it been for nothing? And my message is, even if we just get Bitcoin, Ethereum, and stable coins, we've still achieved something incredibly important. I think, of course, there's a lot more to it than that. But um, I think we've done something really important, even if the main outputs of our work are just Bitcoin, Ethereum, and stablecoins. Stablecoins themselves are really going to dramatically reshape the global financial topology. And we basically see this happening already. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I, I think what is fascinating is the transparency. The fact that you could go out and you could identify the on-chain volumes, separate it from the exchange volumes, and think about... Uh, not just the velocity, but the number of addresses. And when you say that's growing literally, it makes sense. In in some parts, you know, I, I think back to how did we get here? And I was in the industry when Lehman had its bankruptcy issues 15 years ago this month. And I think about how that was a catalyst in its own right to get the Bitcoin white paper out and then talk about the electronic peer-to-peer exchange networks. And over time, we've heard a lot of different uh, narratives and it seems that store of value is one that that sticks quite well with Bitcoin. But you've been talking a lot about the the use of the stable coins as a medium of exchange, and I think back to some of the questions that regulators and investors were were dealing with during the Lehman collapse, which was who is exposed to whom, and okay, how many different times has an asset been rehypothecated. And now, because of this technology, you actually have the ability to go out and independently verify that. And that, that to me, is amazing. Yeah, I, I, the transparency is the beauty of blockchain. That's like maybe the number one best thing about blockchains, frankly, is the transparency you get in so many different ways. So in how many other financial um, payment systems could you go and as a completely independent third party audit the entire supply of the liabilities? I mean... We don't even know to the nearest trillion how many euro dollars there are, for instance. That's how <laughs> diffuse the data is, right? Uh, we stopped counting a while back. Um, looking at the individual transactions on a per blockchain basis, uh, per stablecoin basis, 
Uh, you can do interesting geographical associations. Uh, time zone analysis is an interesting thing. Chainalysis puts out their yearly adoption report, adoption of crypto report. You can segment transaction by region. That's absolutely fascinating. And then, you know, stablecoins offer interesting transparency in other ways too. It's become a convention that they do these daily or monthly attestations regarding their assets. That's just a convention. But that's because crypto people have this desire for transparency because they're very mistrustful <laughs> of centralized intermediaries. Um, so we're actually, I'd say you have better data regarding the asset portfolios of stablecoin issuers than you have for other types of payment system intermediaries. And a great example of this is to look at PayPal stablecoin. So with PayPal stablecoin, because they're issuing a stablecoin, they have to compete in that market where issuers are already very transparent. They have a very high bar to clear. They're also regulated by NYDFS as a trust company, so their stablecoin is bankruptcy remote. Interestingly, the generic PayPal liabilities, the ordinary PayPal liabilities on the app are not um, bankruptcy remote as far as I understand. And they that portfolio has a much longer duration, much un, much less clear liquidity profile. Whereas the stablecoin is highly, I think it's basically all reverse repos and short dated treasuries. Um, so, interestingly, from the user perspective, the transparency of the stablecoin system is far better than the sort of like ordinary user liabilities that are in PayPal. And then the other thing I'll mention is crypto isn't immune to rehypothecation and uh, the buildup of excessive leverage. Like, we, of course, we saw this in 2022. But now we see a reaction to that, where there's a lot of firms that are coming to exist, they're being started, that are focused on basically proving balance sheets, like proving one entity's balance sheet to another. Uh, I advise one, for instance, called Proven. Um, there's others, like Credora does this. You know, there's, there's a few others that I've seen emerge. And the idea there is to prove sort of like the uniqueness of some asset as it's held by one custodial entity, so that lending, for instance, you don't run into kind of the three hours problem where the same collateral is pledged many times over. And a lot of these are using kind of zero knowledge proofs, things like that. So new technologies that have been developed for crypto that now give end users, borrowers, lenders, much greater assurance such that you don't have to trust each other as much. You don't have to use like these traditional processes. So yeah, it, it excites me a great deal. Uh, even though you know accounting doesn't excite most people, I think we're actually really pushing the envelope here. Yeah, I, it, it's funny because I agree with you. Accounting doesn't excite most people, but if you've gotten yourself in the problem of having to prove something, it is great to have the, the receipts. And you know, we talk a lot in the industry, and I know you also have spoken uh, quite vocally about the importance of the proof of reserves for these assets, so that you know there's something to there to back the the liability or the IOU. And, you know, in some ways, I, I look at reporting for things like money market funds, where they're disclosing the holdings of the portfolio that comprise the, the stable, I'll call it relative stable value, but it's earning income. Uh, and I'll sort of use that as a chance to pivot a bit, because for one of the most uh, broadly util uh, used tokens, stable coins, you say, yeah, I can't get interest on my stable coin. I hear that all the time. Like I have to take counterparty risk in order to get yield. And then I would remind people, well, you've already taken counterparty risk to the issuer of the stable coin. So people have been willing traditionally to take some of these counterparty risks. We saw the defaults of different lenders and the knock on effects. Uh, but then we think about this often through the lens of U.S. people, uh, U.S. Uh, residents, whether you're natural resident or you uh, become naturalized citizen, it's a first world type of experience. But around the world, that's not the case. And you mentioned euro dollars earlier. Many people may not realize that those are just bank issued IOUs that are used to create exposure to the dollar. And in some ways, stable coins could be viewed similarly. But uh, you've been talking recently about some of the offshore stable coin uses and the fact that they might not just address the needs for payment vehicles, but they could also be used to generate income. Could you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, it's such an interesting change that's happening in these markets. I mean, the big catalyst, of course, is the fact that 
you know, short term treasuries are trading up 535 basis points, right? If but they weren't, they were at zero 18 months ago, right? So the opportunity cost of holding a zero yielding note effectively uh, is very significant now. And now, if you're uh, holding a stable coin issued by, let's say, an issuer that's not bankruptcy remote, which is probably the two largest issuers of stable coins, in my assessment, you are incurring return free risk, right? So, like, how much would you want, how much would you insist on being paid to be an unsecured creditor of one of these issuers? For me, that number is greater than zero, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so there's like, an offsetting thing, which is the "quote unquote" convenience yield of holding a stablecoin. So economists talk about the convenience yield of cash. So physical cash doesn't pay anything, of course. It's just a note. Although there have been uh, episodes in U.S. history when physical cash did bear interest. Actually, uh, the greenbacks during um, the Civil War era; uh, those had uh, literal coupons that you could uh, clip off and redeem. Uh, so this was back when um, I think that was in the in the Confederacy, but they were trying to induce people to hold the notes, so there was a yield attached to them. But ordinarily, cash doesn't bear interest, but people still hold it um, because there's a convenience yield. Like it's easy to tip your uh, tip your waiter in cash or uh, your valet. You know, there's all sorts of transactions that are more convenient with cash. The same is true with stable coins. You know, people are willing to incur the total lack of yield in exchange for having the privilege to transact on public blockchains. There have been yield sources on blockchains. You know, the quote unquote crypto native yield was higher than, let's say, the treasury bill rate for a long time. That's certainly changed over the last 12 months. And now there's kind of this soul searching happening where I think people in crypto generally realized. It didn't make that much sense to have these zero-yielding stables, but the largest issuer is a little hamstrung. Like a Circle being a US-based entity, they're not going to be able to embed that yield into their stablecoin on-chain, although USDC is passing on some of these rewards. They don't call it a yield. Uh, you know, uh, Coinbase accounts for it as a marketing expense, but they are just passing on the yield. So if you hold USDC and Coinbase, I think you're eligible. Uh, that's an interesting accounting technique. I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, Tether, they just collect 100% of the net interest margin. And as the incumbent, I think that they are going to try and do that for as long as they can. But now we see a lot of other issuers coming out and you know just competing on the basis of yields paid. And it's similar to the banking system where, let's say you're a newer uh, neobank or fintech and you want to compete for deposits, you might offer a higher rate. Uh, so... That's exactly the competition we're seeing playing out. Most of these issuers that are attaching yield to a stablecoin, because technically speaking, it's trivial to do it. There's already yield-bearing assets in crypto, like staked ETH. Um, You know, it's the most common way we see is a rebasing asset, where the quantity of tokens in your wallet just increases over time. Um, So we're seeing these issuers emerge to do this, although they're mostly doing it ex-US, because of course. The SEC takes a very broad view of what is a security. So this wouldn't help the analysis for sure for a stablecoin. They already alleged that BUSD was a security, even though it bore no yield whatsoever, which I thought was a a strange assessment. So now we're seeing these issuers offering yield. And I think that will cannibalize the existing supply a fair amount. So I think we are due for a significant change here in the markets where Issuers that aren't able or are unwilling to pay yield will actually lose market share materially to some of these new firms. It's just the innovator's dilemma playing out, uh, but it's a very exciting shift to witness. Absolutely. And unfortunately, as a U.S. citizen, I might not be able to take advantage of that uh, because some of these companies will not offer their products to U.S. residents. That's the case with so many crypto things. I mean, virtually all DeFi products now, too. It's very sad. It's a, it's a big shame. You know, in, in some ways, it's ironic because as as a country, we are more than happy to avail foreign investors access to our U.S. Treasury markets. So as, as we continue to print uh, securities and raise funds for the nation, uh, we, we see that um, 
you can purchase it. You can be an offshore entity. It could be used to secure an offshore stable coin, but ultimately the, the U.S. investor wouldn't be able to hold that interest-bearing stable coin. But one of the things I, I know you've talked about recently is uh, the, the changing dynamics around the treasury market. And you mentioned the short-term bills being over 5%. Uh, I checked a little bit earlier today um, in the 10 year, although it's down from the, the highs that it had seen since 2007, was still around 4.6%. So that's a pretty interesting risk reward dynamic. But yet the foreign investors who had been traditional buyers of the US treasuries have been pulling back. And what I heard was that you've got a, a theory on who might be able to step in and take up some of that supply. <laughs> well, the, you know, there's a question of scale here. So, you know, stable coins in the aggregate, the dollar backed stable coins, which of course 99% of the stables are dollar backed, which is great for the US for now. Uh, you know, they were only 130 billion or so. So that's like a mid sized asset manager. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at the sovereigns, that would place the stable coins as a cohort a 16th um, in terms of sovereign nations holding uh, US debt. But there a lot of entities that were previously buyers of treasuries have now become net sellers, uh, which is actually not just um, official foreign holders, but they're a big segment. So Japan is selling. They're the number one holder of uh, government debt, U.S. government debt. They're selling the, down their position to defend the yen. China is selling. They're the number two holder. They're selling down their position either because they don't believe treasuries are a great store value, maybe because they think inflation will come back and there'll be a negative real yielding asset, even though right now they're positively real yielding, um, or maybe because they want to limit their uh, political exposure to the U.S., kind of post uh, Russia's reserves being seized. I, if I were China, I would be mindful of that as well. And as a generally speaking, foreign official, hold, official holders of uh, government, U.S. government debt have been selling down their position since 2014. So I think there's been a recognition abroad that U.S. Treasuries used to be as good as gold, and now with the debt position of the U.S., you know, really significant debt to, debt to GDP. And if you look historically, around 125 percent debt to GDP, that's very high for us. If you look historically, when we reached those thresholds, we basically, like after World War II, for instance, we engaged in monetary repression so to speak, um, basically running uh, inflation variable and high, whether that was deliberate or not, um, and reducing in real terms the size of the debt. And that would be one way we could reset our debt position, uh, especially as our interest payments uh, in the US go to over a trillion dollars a year. So I think at the margin, stable coins are pretty useful. Um, the fact that they reference the dollar is very helpful. And the fact that the convention in crypto land is to have full reserves, even though banks are not you know, fully reserved, for instance, uh, and the convention is to back them fully, typically with short-dated treasuries. I think that's something quite interesting that Washington should recognize is happening. Instead, most of the conversation in Washington is about how dangerous stablecoins are and how risky they are and how they risk financial stability in this country and things like that. I find that position curious, given that I, as I have compared stablecoins to euro dollars, you know, ultimately, even though euro dollars were less controlled than the domestic banking system, the US found it valuable to shore up that market and create swap lines with other central banks and provide dollar liquidity on demand to foreign central banks who then provide liquidity to the banks themselves that were issuing the euro dollars if they needed dollar liquidity in a time of crisis. My theory is that ultimately the same thing will happen with stablecoins. The major stablecoin issuers will gain a more proximate access to the Fed itself, even though the Fed has been very reticent to embrace stablecoins. In fact, the Fed has done precisely the opposite this year, which is to stymie new issuers that would banks that were trying to become stablecoin issuers effectively limiting stablecoin activity in this country to non banks like Circle or PayPal, for instance. So I think Washington is taking the wrong tack on this. And I think there's very meaningful sort of fiscal reasons and um, 
political strategic reasons why they should actually forge a closer relationship with the stablecoin issuers as opposed to a more distant one. Yeah, it's interesting because on the brief, we, we've spoken often about Custodia Bank and Caitlin Long's project, the special purpose depository institution where you know it's not a savings and loan, it's really a savings. So you'd have basically a 100% reserve portfolio and you know, obviously that has ongoing litigation. So we'll just acknowledge that that's uh, to be played out. But I also think about it at uh, two different angles. I'll sort of throw out there and you can choose to take one path or another. Personally, I always think back to the purposes of banks in the U.S. in, in some ways is to help uh, strengthen the economy or, or provide liquidity in the economy. So you have this extension of credit and these IOUs that exist. And if you are looking at a, a, a tokenized asset that can only be given in one state at a given time, then I question at times if there are concerns about credit contraction. Now, you mentioned you can rehypothecate to some extent, but the other angle I think might even be a little bit more interesting to pursue is you've got the Fed that's come forward with Fed now as a way to try and enable 24 by 7 uh, payments over Fed wire, whereas previously, um, there, there have been limits to uh, the ability to move funds. And I think stable coins really stepped into that um, opportunity, if, particularly for some of the large institutions that were trading crypto. But then you could see beyond that, that you have the, the access to be able to move funds and, and make payment remittances or uh, choose to invest basically any time around the clock. So feel free to go, go in either direction. But I, I always... The credit one always been in the back of my mind since I got into this space because I used to run a repo operation. And when I first realized that when people lend cash to the counterpart, you get collateral, that counterpart's spending the cash. So you're secured, but you're trusting they're going to be able to get that cash back to you. And then once you realize that they could rehypothecate assets, you start realizing it can be a tangled web. And the beauty of being able to verify the state was something that that made me uh, want to learn more about blockchain. But I do think just that ability to control or have more influence over the payment rails is, is something that um, is still significantly important to the regulators. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'll touch on both points. So I think it's interesting that the convention emerged that stablecoin issuers have to be fully reserved by the shortest dated maturity, most liquid assets. That obviously wasn't always the case, but that's sort of what has emerged as the standard in the last 12 months or so. Circle kind of reacted to a lot of the critiques that people made of Tether, and Circle brought down the maturity of their portfolio. They had used to have more ersatz uh, assets backing that thing. Now they publish the QSIPs of all the short-term treasuries every month. Um, and we see reverse repos being used as well. I always found that interesting because um, the the essence of banking is the maturity transformation, of course. And I do think that's a socially valuable good. Is banks are allowed to what is it borrow short and lend long, or the other way around, <laughs> whichever one it is. Uh, they're allowed to engage in this transformation. That's uh, you know they're providing ordinary banking, commercial banking services people, but they're also providing mortgages, they're lending to small businesses. That has that necessarily entails a longer maturity. And uh, so that's kind of like a socially valuable thing, right? Like the creation of credit and like, frankly, banks are the main way that money is created, in my opinion. Um, maybe the Austrians will disagree with me on that. So maybe there's something about stable coins that's... Um, you know, really idiosyncratic that requires that basically the collateral is siloed and only short-term government debt is sufficient to be the asset side of the balance sheet. But I'm a little skeptical of that. You know, if like a return of the PayPal example, PayPal isn't bound when we're talking about the ordinary liabilities on PayPal. They're not bound by this convention that everything be highly liquid, short-dated government debt. So I kind of wonder if as this market develops, stablecoin issuers don't decide to seek more yield, better margins by by moving into more exotic asset types. Um, one interesting critique I've heard of stablecoins is that they actually are silos or sinks for treasuries. 
So they actually pull treasuries out of the banking system where ordinarily treasuries can kind of be redeployed, uh, highly liquid, you know, highly frequently transferred, and they kind of take treasuries and they silo them out. And then the only thing that can be done with them is issuing stable coins against them. And that, in theory, um, would be a drag on the financial system. I've seen this critique from a few places. Actually, Caitlin Long has talked about it a little bit. And I have some sympathy for that, although that's not my expertise. But yeah, I do wonder if the stablecoin market will change and come to resemble the conventional banking sector a little bit more. Um, the other thing I'll comment on is I think part of the resistance to stable coins from sort of like the central banking side is that they are like the narrow bank, TMB, if you remember that whole episode. And I think the worry was that the narrow bank would be too good, too safe, so to speak, and that everybody would just use the narrow bank and they would pull their money out of all the commercial banks and that would cause the collapse of the commercial banking system. Um, <laughs> because if you're getting the same product, why wouldn't you use the thing that's like backed by the most and the you know, safest collateral, the direct access of the central bank? But I don't know how persuasive that is to me. I mean, we do see this slow, not a bank run, but a bank walk whereby people are now moving out of their commercial bank accounts and they're choosing to hold treasuries through money market mutual funds and things like that. So we're already seeing this drain, especially as the commercial banking system has kept their interest rates low that they're passing on. So we're seeing this happen already. I don't see that as like massively destabilizing to the financial system. And so I don't see how stable coins are any more of a threat than money market mutual funds. To me, they look very similar. So I don't know how worried I am about that objection. Now on the second piece with um, FedNow, I find it very interesting that the U.S. lags basically the rest of the developed and even part of the developing world in terms of payment system efficiency and speed. Uh, if you if virtually any other country you go to, <laughs> they have a um, fast settling payment system, which we basically don't have, or like a, one that's accessible to retail. So I suppose FedNow is meant to close that gap. And one sentiment I've heard expressed many times from central bankers is, well, no one's going to need stable coins when we create this next innovation in payment system functionality. So we have real-time final settlement available at the retail level. And I think that's preposterous, right? Because it's not the reason people use stable coins. Uh, people use stable coins it, for some of the stable coins they use it because it's considered remote from the US banking system and they want to eliminate their exposure to any regulatory harassment that might be happening here. People use stable coins because they're interoperable, which certainly banking systems are not. They're definitely not interoperable, certainly not within different nations. And they use stable coins because, of course, you can use them in smart contracts, which you can, um, you know, use FedNow dollars in a smart contract. So I always find it curious that some central bankers think that stablecoins will go away if they just innovate. And what I worry about is um, if they try and eliminate uh, private sector competition for dollar settlement, dollar clearing by trying to regulate away stablecoins once they release these uh, tools like FedNow, which I suppose is live already. Uh, that's something that worries me because I don't see it as the government's role to try and compete with the private sector in terms of innovation. Um, I think it's completely fine to release something like FedNow, but it's not fine to try and ban stablecoins because they're perceived as competitors to FedNow. I, I agree. With you. And they, they're on different rails. So FedNow is the traditional rails just with extended hours is a simple way to describe it. Whereas when you talk about tokenized representation of dollars, you're using oftentimes public permissionless chains. And you talked about the cost of, or really the friction that can be involved in the banking system. Well, when you remove the correspondent banking drag, you have both lower costs, but also faster efficient transfer of value. So I, I think you're right. I don't think that the two necessarily solve the same problem. But I, I used to think of it as, oh, maybe stable coins will be commercial bank money and central bank digital currencies will be the central bank money. But I, my, my thinking on that has evolved. And I, I really do think of it as um, it may be more like cash versus just alternatives to that. And 
I, I think about the stable coins in many ways as digital cash. Um, again, bearer instrument. You know, if if I lose it because I've got it in a private wallet or self-hosted wallet, and that's on me. Just like if I drop a twenty on the ground when I'm walking down the street, and you know, it's still as you mentioned, uh, insulated from the risks of those other entities. So earlier this year, we saw that we had some banks who were shuttered. Uh, and in some cases, they people questioned whether or not they were um, justly shuttered. But the fact of the matter is, when you have your value in an institution and not within your own control, you are subject to how that institution responds to the regulatory environment. So um, I think ultimately, we, it's something as, as an American, I don't typically get overly concerned with, but I'm aware of. Many people are not, but oftentimes we see people overseas in uh, maybe a less geopolitically stable environment. It is an everyday reminder. And I know you've been talking a lot to people about uh, Argentina and different places. And I, I think ultimately where we find ourselves is yeah, true appreciation depends on the perspective. And for a lot of us and a lot of the people who may be sitting in uh, seats trying to advise uh, folks in Washington, they might not be able to take the, the different perspective. They may still look at it through, um, a, I'll call it a more myopic lens. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, your circumstances determine your views on things so many times. And uh, this is a great example. I mean, the U.S. is obviously very well served. We make fun of the U.S. a little bit. Um, when I talk to payment entrepreneurs in other countries, they always like talk about how broken the U.S. payment system is. Actually, <laughs> mainly because of uh, like credit cards and chargeback fraud and things like that, which seems to be a very American thing. So that always amuses me. But generally speaking, Americans are very well served. You know, if we wanted to make a peer-to-peer -peer payment, there's about a dozen different ways we could do that right now, and we happen to have great property rights. The dollar is one of the least inflationary sovereign currencies. Everyone complains about inflation, but we're actually pretty well off, all, everything considered, especially even compared to Europe, for instance. And uh, you know, treasuries themselves are are the basically the global store value asset. So, even though I do think stablecoins themselves offer advantages over bank dollars, namely, before SVB, I wasn't concerned about banks failing. No, I. I I am a bit more. <laughs> and now the banks, given that we have this BTFP facility, have become more stablecoin-like because there is this de facto uh, super FDIC guarantee that exists, in my opinion. Uh, I think the, the Fed is kind of signaling that to us. They actually have become more stablecoin-like, but I think a you know segregated SPV held for the benefit of holders where the only thing that's being held is you know three month T bills with a lot of dis disclosure and transparency around that. To me, that is a more secure structure than a dollar in a commercial bank as it's currently configured. So even for Americans, there's advantages. However, the very clear and obvious and apparent advantages come when you decontextualize yourself and you come at it from the perspective of someone in the ninety six percent of the world that is not American. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, if you look at the, this, is why I encourage people to look at the Chainalysis Geography of Crypto report. I'm just looking at the numbers right now. The US is actually the number four in terms of per capita usage of crypto. So, it's very highly penetrated. But the other top 10 are India, in order India, Nigeria, Vietnam, Ukraine, the Philippines, Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil, Thailand. I mean, we're talking emerging markets, frontier markets. Latin America, Southeast Asia in particular, we also see with our kind of eyes on the ground, we see a lot of usage in Africa. We see a lot of usage in Eastern Europe. So, you know, this isn't just a single region. It's not a single typology. But the things that a lot of these places have in common are, uh, and this is for general crypto transactions, not just stable coins. I'd love to see it broken out with just stable coins. What we see is relatively weak monetary regimes. Uh, inflationary systems, maybe um, unreliable fiat currencies, uh, a generally lack of property rights, maybe a banking system that's untrustworthy. So maybe you could even have a dollar liability in your local banking system, but it's not credible. Like a dollar liability in the Argentine banking system is not credible. There's a lot of historical precedent for why that is. In Lebanon, for instance, a dollar 
or any kind of liability in that banking system, the whole system became Ponzi-like. So it wasn't a credible deposit. You know, you see this happening over and over, seen in Turkey. Uh, so those are things those places have in common. And I think looking at where crypto is widely adopted, it tells you a lot, a lot about what crypto is. It's something that offers, in particular, stable coins. It offers you property rights. It offers you a digital bear asset style experience whereby, yes, it's on you to custody it yourself if you're doing it directly, but that's a virtue when it, you're comparing it to maybe a deposit in the bank system where you may not be able to withdraw it at all. Or you know, the moment you need it the most, you can't pull it out of the bank. Um, so I think that's an interesting point is looking empirically at where the transactions are actually occurring and where you see the stablecoin adoption and using that to develop a view of what the asset actually is and what it's good for. So going from empirics to teleology. So I really recommend that report. I think they're due to publish their 2023 edition in the coming weeks as well. Oh, yeah. I, I, I took down my notes. I'm definitely going to look it up. And as I listened to you describe that, in some ways I thought about uh, a phrase that's often used in different, different um, contexts. But in this case, it seems that crypto is really meeting people where they are. And based on where they are, uh, it will drive their, their perspective and their willingness to use it or even preference to use it. So Yeah, I mean, the, the number one crypto asset, crypto application that exists by user count is Tether on the Tron blockchain. That's just a fact. And you may not like Tether. You may not like the Tron blockchain, for that matter. Trust me, I have a lot of issues with Tron given the the coin metrics experience trying to run Tron nodes and get the data out of them um I have a lot of qualms with the Tron leadership so if you're listening you know I got a bone to pick with you but uh it's just a fact <laughs> tether on Tron is the crypto dollar for emerging markets um tens of billions of dollars of transactions a day um millions of users weekly um it's pretty remarkable and uh, of course, both of those systems, Tether itself and Tron, have issues, but that uh, seems to be what has caught on. So I think that's worth noting, at least. Yeah, it's re certainly reflected the numbers. I mean, I think uh, Tether comprised about 67, 68% of the total stablecoin market value. And when you talked about velocity, I can't even imagine the, the calculation of the velocity based on just the, the market cap uh, ratio. Yeah, it, it turns over, you know, a dozen, twenty times a year. Um, so, it and Tether's been growing their market share. You know, I was excited when they're losing market share because Tether has felt many times like this beacon for critics and kind of this black mark hanging over the industry. And certainly, they haven't done things right from a transparency perspective. Totally acknowledge that, but they have grown their market share, especially in the last year, especially since really. Specifically, over the last 12 months exactly, since FTX collapsed, which is almost a year ago now, after FTX, things became very hostile in this country. There were a number of hostilities uh, against banks servicing crypto in the US, against the crypto industry in general. Virtually all the financial regulators in the White House itself like turned more hostile on crypto. And what we saw was Crypto startups leaving the country, crypto entrepreneurs, crypto LP, crypto VC, and also um, and firms, individuals, high net worths offshoring their balance sheets out of the US into offshore stable coins. So you see this in the data. You see around the time of uh, the SBB collapse, you know, people left USDC and you see these funds flow linearly into, tr into Tether. Right. Even though Tether, people ask me a lot of time, non-crypto non people ask me, why would anyone use Tether? It's because they're perceived as being more remote from the banking system here, from U.S. regulation. So you actually see even American entities moving their funds. And you can see this based on the on-chain data and a time zone analysis. American entities that were holding USDC moving their funds into Tether. So as the USDC market cap declined, Tether market cap increased. And so the onshore offshore split was about 50 50 with stables before FTX. Now it's more like 75 25 offshore onshore. Yeah, it's fascinating because I, I look, went back to look at the data too. So I went back to the, the Terra Luna collapse, then I went back to look at FTX and then looking at SVB. And 
frankly, there, there's the, the exposure to the U.S. banking system, but then there was also the um, temporary depegging, which was tied to the question of whether or not um, the issue would be able to re- recoup the funds that they had on deposit at the bank that exceeded the FDIC insurance coverage. And clearly, we know in hindsight that that risk was um, offset by actions taken by the, by the central bank. Uh, but um, ultimately, I think it it created concern where there wasn't concern before. Yeah, totally. No one ever really thought to worry about the U.S. banking system. I certainly didn't, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could say that was a failure of management, maybe by circle leadership, but nobody expects SVB to go down. I mean, how many of our startups had their balance sheet on SVB? Many, many of them did. Um, and that's because SVB offered the best service to startups, just factually. You know, they were the startup bank, they were the VC bank. So some people now look back at that episode and think, oh, we should have let FSBB fail. That would have been utterly catastrophic uh, for venture capital in this country. Also very bad for USDC, too. So I'm, I'm glad we didn't. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I haven't verified this myself, but I heard a lot of talk about, well, this is really an asset liability mismatch. It's the duration mismatch. Cost of capital going up, the balance sheet assets that they had had lower yields. So that that caused those on balance sheet assets to be valued lower, which is what causes the the, the lack of equilibrium. But uh, you know, all that aside, I wanted to sort of maybe bring us back to let's try to end on a positive note here. Like you've been on a path to try and educate people. You've been engaging with people all over the world. You were at Singapore 2049. You were recently at the Masari Mainnet event. You're talking to a lot of people. What excites you the most about these discussions and what you're seeing unfold in front of us. Yeah. So actually, you know, I kind of have been in hibernation for a little bit and I decided that I had some new things to talk about. <laughs> so I signed up for, I think, 14 speaking appearances over a six week period. So we've done, uh, we've done nine of those. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're getting there. <laughs> um, my problem was I ran out of original things to say. So I started repeating myself. Uh, but uh, you know what does excite me is the fact that the regulators of the world don't all move in lockstep, and maybe they used to. Maybe the SEC used to set the tone, and then everybody else would just mechanically follow them. But I don't think that's true anymore, and we experience this directly. You know, I'll be in Bermuda next week. We just did a deal in Bermuda. They pass crypto regs very different from the ones we have in the U.S. Mica in Europe, the EU is now more progressive on crypto than the U.S. is. I can't remember the last time we saw that with any kind of regulatory thing, with the EU being more permissive and laying out clear rules of the road, whereas the US is being more hostile and opaque. Then look at Singapore. I mean, very clear embrace of the crypto space. And certainly if you look at the Token 2049 conference, there are 10,000 attendees in Singapore. That was up against permissionless here in Austin, much lower numbers, You know, very clear. The fact that the regulators in Singapore and Hong Kong are willing to meet with us, like the likes of me, is remarkable too. Um, they are very keen to actually meaningfully bring crypto capital entrepreneurs, VC, to their shores, and they're willing to pass rules that allow you to do business. Certainly, it's not an anything goes type situation. I mean, Singapore was the heart of the blow ups in 2022. They had Terra Luna was based there, Three Arrows was based there. They had a handful of other local firms that blew up spectacularly. So they're more cautious about it now. Hong Kong, of course, um, China had banned crypto entirely (laughs) in 2021. They're also more cautious. But they're opening up deliberately and carefully with a view towards regulation that allows good actors to actually thrive and to just run their businesses if they like to. So that's really impressing me. So we now see this inner jurisdictional computation for crypto capital, wealth, entrepreneurs, talent, human capital, right? Um, and so that's really exciting. And so even if the U.S. remains relatively chilled, uh, even for the foreseeable, there's alternatives and there's options. I don't think we've ever seen nation states compete for an industry like this before. So regardless of what happens, whether the U.S. remains somewhat hostile or they change their tone, uh, there's you know favorable domiciles and places to do business, and uh, 
I find it interesting that the stable coins are the kind of the big growth sector in crypto and they still remain very dollarized. So it's still very supportive of US interests in terms of being able to promote uh, sanctions, enforcement, political objectives like that, or um, making the debt less costly to service. It's still supportive of US interests. Even if the US doesn't like the crypto space, the crypto space likes the US. So that's kind of one of the funny ironies here. That, that, that's a great quote. And I, I, I agree with you. I think the competition for talent and capital is is global in nature because of the fact that these assets are. And uh, it is exciting to see. We, we try to follow and, and look. Sometimes it seems more often to the east for some advantages as to, or insights as to what might come. Uh, you never know, but um, it definitely gives, uh, I'll say, uh, hope and inspiration for those of us who are trying to build and really see how this evolution of technology and finance uh, can be liberating around the globe. So, Nick, thank you so much for coming and joining us. We know you got a, a very busy schedule, but uh, we really genuinely appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure. I mean, more often than not, I'm hearing your voice over a podcast on the, the on the brink or as you're a guest somewhere else in Bloomberg or other places. And uh, it's really been a treat to sit down and talk to you today. So thank you. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Crypto as an asset class is highly volatile, can become illiquid at any time, and is for investors with a high risk tolerance. Crypto may also be more susceptible to market manipulation than securities. Crypto is not insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or the Securities Investor Protection Corporation. Investors in crypto do not benefit from the same regulatory protections applicable to registered securities. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. This podcast was produced by the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology also known as FCAT. FCAT does not offer digital assets nor provide clearing or custody of such assets. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide tax, legal, insurance, or investment advice and should not be construed as an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy, or a recommendation for any security or other asset by any fidelity entity or third party. Views expressed are as of the date indicated, based on the information available at the time, and may change based on market or other conditions. Unless otherwise noted, the opinions provided are those of the authors and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. Fidelity does not assume any duty to update any of the information. Fidelity and any other third parties mentioned in the podcast are independent entities and are not affiliated. Mentioning them does not suggest a recommendation or endorsement by Fidelity. This information is not intended for distribution to or use by any person or entity in any jurisdiction or country where such distribution would or use would be contrary to local law or regulation. Persons accessing this information are required to inform themselves about and observe such restrictions. Third-party trademarks appearing herein are the property of their respective owners. All others are the property of FMR LLC. Copyright 2023 FMR LLC. All rights reserved. 1040156.